All right, and sir, as I've told other people, you're free to take your mask off while you're testifying. If you choose to leave it on, that's fine. She just may ask you to speak up. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. So, if you will, some more. If you would introduce yourself, please. My name is Roger Self. How old are you, Self? I'll be 66 years old in July. Well, right now I'm unemployed. You've been in custody since this occurred. It's for be three years coming up in May, yes, sir. Before that, what did you do? I owned a company uh, that that I founded with a partner in 1989 to assist companies with uh, internal losses. Basically, we were licensed private investigators, but we specialized in not the normal things that they do, but more business-related losses. And then in 2003, I uh, separated from my partner and continued the company uh, myself after 2003. What's the name of the company? Southeastern Loss Management. And uh, when you were working with the company, what was your position? Uh, well, uh, not only being the owner, uh, and again, I'll go back to 2003, if that's okay, move forward. I mean, I was the owner, but I actually uh, supervised the entire company and then realized shortly thereafter I needed help, that business was really good, so uh, that's when I sought out Mr. Salmon and and, ha and several other folks. And Mr. Salmon described the sort of the operations where he does the background checks and you were sort of responsible for them. Well, it, it, it grew in different levels. Uh, uh, just before he came on, the background business was growing so rapidly and we were doing everything by hand, meaning we would search individual records, put them together and send them. And his job was to automate that to where we could find companies that would compile that instantly. And that was his main focus, but also he was licensed and worked as an investigator when needed and helped me to schedule cases. Did you do a lot of investigative work? Uh, primarily I did, but uh, again, I had several contract private licensed investigators that I would farm things out to when needed and that became, that increased over the years. Business was very uh, profitable and very successful. When did you become a licensed private investigator? In 1989. Before that, uh, is that when you were working at Bell? Uh, no, I, I went to work at Belk. Uh, it kind of was a by chance, part time started out, and uh, I was in going to Gardner Webb College and went through a divorce at that time. And while I was there part time, I happened to stumble on some internal cases, some very large ones, and Belk offered me the position to head up the loss prevention there in Gastonia, and then it grew out to several of their other locations. So I left them in 1989 and started this business in 1989. When did you start working with Bell? It, I would think that would have been around, nine, it, around 82, maybe before, I, I'm not real sure. I left them temporarily uh, in 87, went with Toys R Us as a regional loss prevention guy, but uh, Belt called me and asked me to come back, and, and I did. I went back with them and stayed there until 1989. Well, 
when you were working at the Southeastern Loss Management, like, yes, sir. Um, you said that you dealt more with carnal issues in companies. Primarily, that was that was kind of what that was basically what I did with Belk. I mean, we dealt with shoplifting, and but primarily, I focused on the internal theft with the company, and and eventually traveled to several of their stores to set up similar programs and to help them. Uh, with loss prevention, yes, sir. And the company you founded, that was kind of their specialty as well, right? Yes, sir. And actually, one of my first customers was Belk. They hired me, they contracted me back when I left. And from 1989 till 2020, you worked within the, the company that you founded in, in that position, I guess is the best way to say it. Yeah, yes, sir. Up until May of 2018, I, I headed the company. Now, Mr. Self, um, when, did, when did you meet Diane? I think, well, we were married in 1982. No, 1984, and I believe either in 82, maybe earlier, somewhere in that range. I'm, I'm not real good at that, but somewhere in that range, 82, 83, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure. So you got married in 1984? Yes, sir. Um, you had two daughters with Diane? Yes, sir. And, and those were... Kate and and Taylor. When was Kate born? Kate was born in 1992, and Taylor was born in 1990. She's the oldest. Time that uh, you and Diane had a where you live in now? No, we actually started out over near where the flea market is off 321 at a small house. And uh, when we were married, that's where we lived for from 84 until around 88 or 89, somewhere. And then that's when we moved on Harden Road. I adopted uh, Jason Self with my first marriage. When we got married, Jay, uh, his mom, Rita, uh, she was a single mom at that point, and Jason and I kind of hit it off. I was very young. I think I was only 20, but he didn't have a relationship with his dad, so I told her I would like to adopt, adopt him. And then Josh was born in 1979. Yeah, he was uh, Rita and I's biological son. But Jason, I felt, was just as much my son. Now, as uh as the children were growing up, can you describe your role in their lives at that point? Well, I was very young, and but I tried to do my best as a fatherly figure. Jason's mom, uh, Rita, had very supportive parents. They lived up up near. Uh, on the other side of Cherubel, up in the north part of the county, maybe even in Lincoln County, and we would frequently go visit with them, and 
we did things together, you know, as normal family does, the beach, the mountains. Uh, engaged in youth sports? Sir? Are they engaged in youth sports? Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure they were. I, I, I know uh, Josh was. And I can't remember what all Jason was involved in. He was a very, he's a very intelligent guy mechanically, and he he could work on anything. And but everything, everything, I just did my best at that time. And at that time, uh, as they were young, you were you were just beginning to work with adults about that time. Is that right? I was. A police officer when we got married and then after that I went with Belk I, I there was a little bit of in-between time I was actually thinking about going into full-time ministry and went to college but every everything was fine Jason's mom was very supportive of, of both children and uh, but eventually uh, I think part of it, I don't remember all the details, but part of it was, you know, we we ended up uh, separating, and I'm not really sure when, but... And when did you become involved with Harvey Baptist Church? I think I visited there in 1980 or 81, just visited, and... Uh, I was with another church and we did some skits and things there and when we got through a gentleman asked me to would I be interested in working with your students and I said I don't think you're I don't think I'm your person I'm going through a divorce and I don't I don't think I'm the man to do the job did, did you decide to do that he kept but he kept I don't want to say bug at me, but every time he would see me, he said, I need you to do this. I need you to work with our students. And I said, well, okay, where are they? <laughs> That's kind of how it started. And when he used the term students, was that the youth group? Yeah, they used to not call it students. They used to call it youth. And so he said, I need you to work with our youth. Mm -hmm. and, I, and eventually I agreed. So I walk in there, and I think there was about five there. Do you remember what year that was? That would have been maybe 80, 81. Maybe. Um, it's close. <laughs> um, once you started, how did that go for you? Well, you know, I, I had no experience as a youth worker. I had read and studied the Bible and had given my life to the Lord uh, in 1978. And, uh, you know, Jason's mom and myself, we went and got involved, and I began to study the Bible. And as a police officer, I had a lot of experience. And so I just walked in there and handed them all a sheet of paper, and I said, I want you to write down anything you want to write down, and then give it to me and leave. But when you come back, bring somebody with you. And they were kind of stunned, you know, so. It was amazing what they wrote. Did they come back recently? They did. You started with a group of around five. Did that number grow? They brought back, they came back with about 10. And I would just cut up and act up and, and, uh, do some funny stuff with the Bible lessons and so I don't know if it was the right thing or the wrong thing I said uh, y'all need to bring somebody back next week I'm not going to let you in unless you bring somebody back <laughs> so they came back with more students and uh, I was kind of overwhelmed with that you keep growing it continued to grow. And I was going through the divorce and separation at that time, so I had extra time on my hands. 
you know, sometimes Rita would have the, the boys and sometimes I would. And so if I had extra time, I said, look, look we'll go out and eat every Sunday night after church. You got to stay for church. And we'll, we'll go out and eat. And the McDonald's was up on the hill on 321. And uh, I would take them over there every Sunday night. And then you could only carry 15 on a van. So that became a problem. And this small country church didn't, I think their total youth budget for the year was $500. Basically, how many uh, youth were coming to your meet? We began to average between 60 and 70 regular. And the highest it got was I told them that there was a man in the church came to me. He said, you tell those young people that are coming that I'll give you, I'll give them $500 to do whatever they want to do if they bring 100 And sure enough, the next weekend, there was 100 students there. Uh, and Diane was amongst one of those and maybe had been there before. She came, she was already out of high school, but they had nowhere to go once they got out. How many people were in charge of this? Uh, the youth? Oh, I had to get help quick. And the guy in the wheelchair, I reached out to him. And, and left several adults, you know, said, I told him, I said, I got to have some help. I, I can't do this. I'm, I'm excited, but I need help. And so just different adults agreed to volunteer. How long did you work with the youth? 24 years. That was when Austin Rammel came. You were still working with the youth when Pastor Ramal arrived? In mm -hmm. I, that would have been in 2003, so from, I, I'm not good at math, you'll have to do the math, but from the early 80s to 2003 was how long I was officially the student pastor. Yeah. Maybe 404, maybe it took a while for us to get a new man in. Yeah. Did, uh, during that period of time, um, was Josh attending Barton Baptist? Yeah, yeah, Jason was. Josh was real little, but he would go with us. Matter of fact, he, I remember going, we took him to the Garden City. There's a chapel down there. We took a busload on an old beat up, borrowed or school bus, it wouldn't half run. It's like 100 degrees, and I remember coming back. Josh started crying when we left Garden City, and he cried till we got to Gastonia. <laughs> and the bus broke down on the way in Darlington, and the restaurant we went in was struck by lightning, and Josh is still crying. It was an interesting trip. It was, and I do remember Diane being there then. That's when we had first really started talking, and I said, you gotta help me with Josh. And so, Jason, he took care of himself. He was no problem. Why did you um, give up? Not only did the way youth or students, their culture changed, and I didn't understand it for one thing. I didn't understand some of the change that I saw. And they, I had them so active and they were so used to that. They wanted to stay up all night and go places and I would do that for a long time. And then with running my business, it was, it was and I was, I thought I was old in, at 40. So I told Austin, I said, maybe you can get a young guy in here and let him take over 
and I'll do whatever else you need me to do. But I stayed on for a while after he came until they found someone. And I believe you said you were a trustee also. That's, yeah, right before he came, we had lost our pastor. The church asked me to head up the trustees, which I'm terrible with numbers. And it's like a business almost. And But I said, I'll give it a try. But I had some older men and women around me that uh, helped me with that. The other trustees helped me. And you said you met Diane. She she graduated, but she was coming to the group. Yeah, well, that became a problem. Once they graduated from high school, there was not another class unless you were older. So they didn't know how, they didn't have a young singles group. So these girls and boys were graduating. They didn't know where to go. So they wanted to stay with the youth group, and then we, they kept staying. And then they were in there as old as 25 years old. And the church came to me and said, hey, that, you know, we're gl glad for the numbers, but we, I said, you're right, we need to separate them. She was there during that time. Once uh, you met Diane and you guys got married, um, you were running your business. No, I was from Belt. Oh, you were Belt at that time. Right. Uh, let's move forward after you found the business. Okay. okay. Um, you found the business shortly thereafter. Uh, you had two more daughters. In 1990 and 1992. Um, all that would have been stressful. Sir? All that would have been stressful, I imagine. Well, I was, they brought so much joy. That was not really stressful. I mean, the business itself was more stressful than coming home. Coming home was my safe place. That's where I was happy, really happy. Spend time with your daughters? As much as I possibly could. Give me some idea of what you do with your daughters. Oh, they well, they were in the youth group, too, you see, even though they wasn't old enough. That was another problem, that, that we did so many things, and the workers I had were so supportive. We did so many fun things for them. Kids that wasn't even old enough to come in there would come knocking on my door and say, we want to join. I said, how old are you? My uncle, 10. I said, well, you wait till you're 12. And so... Some of them wait, some of them would sneak in. My girls were already there, so they felt like that was unfair, so I let them, if their parents were okay, I was okay. That's the way I looked at it. Do you do other things with your daughters, other than just uh, whatever the Oh, we just did the normal. You know, by then we were out there on Harden Road with a lot of land, and had a creek running down beside the house, and I can remember times playing in the creek. You know, I'd go down there and play with them. Play with them in the creek. You know, we just did normal other, you know, we tried to go. Uh, money was real tight then because the business was so new, but we tried to go do family vacation. Most of it was with the youth, you know. I'd say, hey, you want to go somewhere? And they would say yes, and so they would go with us on youth trips. Do you remember where some of the places you went on? Oh, my. We went, we went to a lot of fun things, and then I thought, this is not working, just to go have fun. So in 19... 91, I got all the youth workers and the youth together, and I said, we're not going anywhere else. And they looked at me kind of sad. I said, we're not going anywhere else to have fun. We're going to go 
and find people to help that are in need. And uh, that old guy that testified this morning, he was but about eight or nine years old. But he came, he didn't care what the church said, he came to the youth anyway. And so the first place, we organized a group of just men, some men in the church, and we went to Homestead, Florida, after Hurricane Andrew. It was so devastating. We were totally lost when we got there. We were lost until we left. We never found a place we were supposed to go. We just helped people. It was so devastating. And then we went to some tornado victims in eastern North Carolina. Oh, we, it was so massive. You'd, you'd pull up by side a house and there'd be an old man or an old lady out there. Just The roof's gone. They had tarps on. They had no place to live. There was so much destruction. We just say, what, what can we do for you? And I'm, I am not a carpenter or an electrician or a plumber, but I had men with me that were. So we tried to support them getting back into their house. And little Charlie, he went. He was only, like I say, he must have been, I can't do the math, but he was, I would say he was around 10. And then when we came back, there were some tornadoes in eastern North Carolina, so we went down to eastern North Carolina, and we just drove through the destruction and asked people in the community, what can we do to help? And then we went to Wilmington. And then we went to Oklahoma, we went to Alaska. Alaska? We went to Alaska. Do you drive or fly? We flew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What were you doing in Alaska? We, uh, I first went up there as kind of a research, me and two other men in the church, to see what their needs were, because the Baptist Convention had said there were needs there. Their culture is so, so much different than here. I was unaccustomed to just how dangerous it was to approach a house, <laughs> you know. There were signs in the yard, we'll kill you if you come in our yard. <laughs> so we went to a little small church and found some students, and uh, we had like a Bible school for them, you know, in their community. And uh, we did one out on the Aleutian chain. And then, of course, 9-11 came, and I think that was mostly adults, though, that we took, maybe a few youth. but. That's the kind of things that we begin to do rather than have fun all the time. And you orchestrated that change in the youth group to help people? Uh, there was two purposes, to help the people in need and to teach these young people that that's how they need to pattern their life to help those in need. And it was, uh, there was a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges. We went to West Virginia one time to a county that was once 200,000. After the coal mine left, industry left, there was only left about 60,000 people there. So you can imagine the amount of homes abandoned and businesses abandoned entire towns almost and when we got there it was like a hundred degrees and the little lady that we were to meet she said here over there is where you stay y'all stay and i said no where, that house it was an old run down falling apart probably 150 degrees inside and so we slept on the floor and uh that was much different than the fun they had sleeping at the Hilton. But it was a revival of the Baptist Convention that you were part of? Oh yes. Uh, the culture again was so different. It was so rewarding. It, it would usually take a full day and a half to two days to break in yourself and your students. Some of them would start crying immediately, I want to go home. That's a good luck. And so you got to stay, and we would stay, and at the end of the week, they were excited, and it was just a real rewarding experience to see the young people helping people in need. You did 
that up until 2004? Up, up, well, even after uh, Austin came, I think one of our first places after he came was 9-11. We went to Brooklyn, New York, and we actually stayed in a, an old federal prison, and uh, we would go downtown in Brooklyn and help them rebuild churches. I mean, not churches, a church wanted some work done, and they also wanted some Bible school work done. And we didn't realize the challenges there, because when we pulled up to do the work, the mafia pulls, literally the mafia pulls up one of what we're doing there. We're doing siding. They said, no, you're not. You don't do siding here unless you're, so we told the pastor who was a Polish guy, you got to help us. And so he, he worked it out and we got the siding on the church and we did Bible school. Did you continue to do that after you left your official position as Youth minister or youth pastor? Yes, they, they could, the church was very mission minded of going out and reaching out, but I, I was I was physically exhausted and uh, I began to take just a different role and that was kind of help Austin make the changes which were massive that he wanted to make in his vision. So I began to support him more in that role while a youth pastor come on board. And that was his full-time job. That was his full-time paid job. I never took a salary as a youth pastor. While you were doing this at the church, you were still working at your, at your real job at the business? Yeah. By being the owner, I could schedule my own days off. So. That's how I was able to go on these mission trips. But a lot of times we did that as a family. Taylor, Kate, Josh, Jason had went into the Coast Guard. I don't remember the year after he got out of high school, he went into the Coast Guard and he had been virtually gone ever since because he, he never really came back home. I think he's still in there down in New Orleans somewhere. And so we would make family trips out of the mission trips. You and everybody else would go help whoever needed to be helped? Sometimes there were coordinators already on site that asked for the help. In most cases there were. At 9-11 there was people there who were asking for help. And then we started helping some of them and realized they were multi-millionaires and had insurance. So we had to make some decisions, and we tried to do it tactfully and say, hey, you know, we're here to help those who don't have insurance. The, the dust was so bad in the city, it, it covered lower Manhattan. So we'd go in and help people clean up their homes, and eventually got assigned to Ground Zero, across the street from Ground Zero. And uh, that was a great experience, and then that's how we got over to Brooklyn. In November, we went there immediately. It was they were still every day. We would watch them bring bodies out. Uh, the youth were not there at that point. This was my youth workers, and we would watch them bring bodies out, firemen or police. It was it was an awesome experience. And then we took the youth back and went to. Brooklyn later on. When did you go back to Brooklyn? Well, it would have been when Austin came in 2003 or 4. So it was a couple years later we went back there. Now you talked about when you, when you left the position as pastor and moved on to a different job in the church. Um, at that point, tell me about your relationship with your family. Oh, it was it was great. When Austin came, 
and presented to us the changes that he wanted his vision we got involved with that as a family also and we let our children go to the youth programs that the man had in place that came and hired we hired him and so it worked out great and we continued to stay very involved just I was not as far as involved and nowhere near the level that I was As, um, as the girls grew up, uh, they involved in youth sports, uh, high school sports? You know? Oh, listen, they selected the worst possible thing to be involved in, cheerleading. And they, the cheerleading coach just happened to be like on crack. I'm not literally, but she practiced every single day, every day even Thanksgiving Day, and our girls got involved in cheerleading, and so then it wasn't too bad for football, but when basketball came, you know, they're, even after, after a game, they'd start practice all over again. So, uh, fortunately, the whole time, I never missed a game. In the years that they spent cheerleading, I was able to work my schedule around, making sure I was there, for my girls. After they got out of high school, what path did they take at that point? Oh, they went in all kind of directions. They first said they wanted to be nurses. That lasted about a week. Then they wanted to be dental assistants and Kate got her license and then she didn't like that and then Taylor got hers and she didn't like that so just trying to help them you know narrow down what they wanted to do so they Kate went to work at Ingalls I can't remember what Taylor was doing during that time but she was there believe me she she was there and uh, Kate was at Ingalls and then they got back into dental and back out and then you know it was all over the place for both of them kind of until Kate decided she wanted to be uh, with the Sheriff's Department here in Gaston County. And once she hit on the Sheriff's Department? That she loved it and that's where she stayed. You remember when she started with the Sheriff's Department? I guess she, had, she started out just as regular detention and then she went to the, the law enforcement training. So I'm, I'm terrible on this, is the dates, eight, 16, 17 maybe, 2016, 17, 18 with the Sheriff's Department. <coughs> Um, Taylor said she Oh yeah, I forgot about that. She did. Um, when did she go to Gosh, I don't remember the year, but I guess 2012, maybe somewhere close to that. How old was she there? Uh, it, it seems like we went there twice, so we would have went a semester and then back. And then that's when she learned that she was with a child. And so she asked to come home. So me and her mom drove up and and welcomed her home, back home. Then 27. still working at the uh, business at that point? Yes, sir. That's when Taylor had been a, she went back to dental and she, as she testified this morning, she said, Daddy, I really, she had to be there real early in the morning 
So I would get up and go to her house and get Kennedy up and take her, her to Diane to get her dressed because I wasn't good at that and hair and all that stuff. Diane would get her dressed. I'd take her to preschool. Diane would pick her up. I'd go back to work. And so Taylor said she would like something to where she did not have to be at work so early. And so I, I knew we were going to butt heads. Me and her are so much alike. But I said, okay, I'm going I'm to try this. And in 2017, she came to work full time. You created a position in your company for it? I did. Uh, I actually created a position and I asked her to do marketing and get involved in local marketing uh, programs that they already had in place. There are several here in Gastonia that meet on certain days and she would go and, and uh, meet with them and then she scheduled uh, visits that we had so many visits a month, loss prevention visits to companies, that was the way the program was scheduled. Wouldn't necessarily be a problem. You just had to send guys or ladies who worked for me to KFC or Taco Bell or Subway in Wilmington and Raleigh and Durham and Fayetteville and Lumberton. So she would help organize those visits in what order she helped, that was a massive, massive job to, to do that. We didn't have any kind of software program that would do that for us, so she manually done that. And then she would help schedule and take calls from me. Toward the end of 2017, did you notice anything going on with you? Yeah, well, I sure did. Uh, I did. Tell me what you noticed. Well, and I told my wife this, I had begun to look at porn on the internet and not every day or anything like that, but I began to look at it and then I noticed it was getting worse and I was ashamed, I was humiliated. I didn't say anything to the girls or Diane early on at that point, and uh, that's also at a time when I, it went from that, the porn, to I experimented with uh, a massage parlors, and all along to me, I was trying to justify the fact that I'm not having an affair with a particular person or sexual intercourse, therefore, I knew, I knew I was bad, wrong in my thinking. But I kept saying, I can get through this, I can get past this. I know it's wrong, but I want to get past this. And so that became very, very stressful for me. Uh, because I was so ashamed to go to my, I felt like the sin that I was committing was against God first and my family. It was a selfish act. And so the man that they looked up to, I was ashamed to go to them and say, I wished I had. I wished I would have went to them earlier and said, I I'm struggling with this problem, but I was so humiliated and ashamed of myself. I didn't want to hurt my girls, and I knew it would hurt them. Did you try to seek out someone else to talk to about this issue? Oh, I, I would constantly talk to other men with Christian values, and we would discuss the problem with pornography and other things outside marriage and I would try my best to hold myself accountable because that's something you just don't want to go through town bragging on. And so I continued to try to deal with it alone for a while. Did you eventually speak to your minister about that? Not then, not that early, I don't think. I mean, he, he talked about it frequently and told men to hold other men accountable. 
We even had a company, a youth, a ministry up in Western North Carolina called Snowbird. They would have men's weekends, and the guy that run that, he was like a drill instructor. I mean, he was huge and had big arms, and he would deal with that subject head on in men's groups confidentially and tell them to stop it. And I went to some of those. But I didn't have the courage to say I needed help. This continued to cause you problems? It continued to, I knew in my heart that that was wrong. And I was so ashamed because I have such a wonderful wife. Even though, I mean, we had a, a married for a long, long time. And I'll never forget the night I was wanting to ask her to marry me. I thought I better ask her daddy first. He was a little small fella. He didn't say a lot, but you listened when he said it. And I'll never forget. And he went to bed at 9 o'clock every night, turned the lights out. He gone. He said, there's nothing good in, after 9 o'clock. And that's how he taught Diane and her sister and her brother. So, But I went to their house, and I said, I need to talk to you a minute. He said, okay. It was almost 9, and I he, he walked into his bedroom, and I said, Diane, you, you go tell him I need to talk to him. You go talk to him. And he never come back out, so I was scared to death. And he finally come back out, and I said, you know, I'd like to marry Diane. I'm nine years older than her. And he sat there, and he said, that, that's not a problem. He said, you've been divorced. He said, I'm kind of concerned about that, but I have got to know you. So I'm going to give you my blessings. And he did. And I was so ashamed to go to her and tell her, being such the good person that she was, how I had failed to a temptation. Ultimately, go tell Diane about the situation. Kind of in stages. <laughs> I was scared. Uh, what do you mean in stages? Well, when she was gone to her dad's a lot, you know, I would. The most selfish, one of the most selfish things I've ever done. When she was going to take care of her mom and dad. A lot of times she had to do that on the weekends because her sister worked. And they only had so much money to pay for a caregiver. And that would normally be the time that Diane kind of had her date nights and stuff. And I just told her one time, I said, honey, I, you know, I need you. I don't want to get involved, which I was, but I don't want to get involved in these things. So it kind of started there. A little bit in 2017, I told her there was some problem, but I was not specific. When did you, when did you tell her everything? That also happened in on two different occasions. I originally told her it would have been in 17 that you know I've struggled with porn. And I'm tempted a lot, kind of, and I just left it at that. She was very forgiving. She tried her very, very best. She managed her parents and me. And I was so selfish about what I was doing and what she was doing it was killing me inside. And so that was the second time I approached it. And she was right there for me. And then the third time, which was the last time, no, I'm sorry, I had told her that when we went to the beach that our housekeeper had been sending me, I told her. I said, she's sending me text messages. 
that I'm uncomfortable with wanting, you know, to go have a drink or go to dinner. Even when Diane was with me at the beach house, I would get a text message and I would show her and I so one day I was down there and her her car broke down, this lady's, and her son she was a single mom. He was out surfing and stuff, and he said he was real hungry. And I said, "Well, why don't?" I said, "Let's go get a hamburger." He said, "I can't. I can't. We can't go out and eat. My mom don't have enough money." And I said, "Well, I'll take you to get a steak." He said, "My mom won't let me eat a steak." And I said, "Well, we'll, we'll work that out." So I went with her and her son and Tracy Philbeck. And we went and got uh, at a restaurant. We got a, a steak for him, and we ate. And she left. She she immediately after. She, I think she even drove separate after we got her jeep straightened out. And she left. And I immediately called Diane and told her. I said, I just want you to know, I went out to eat with a lady and her son and Tracy. And uh, Diane, again, was so supportive. She said, that's okay. And I, I, I told her somewhere along the way, I said, this lady is very tempting in her actions. And again, Diane was so supportive. And I had no idea that she was going to get worse in the temptations. Not Diane, the lady. Yeah. Is this in, is this in the period of time where Diane was spending a lot of time with her parents? Mm, well, yeah, she was with her mom, and then after mom died, she was with her dad. It had eased up some, but still, uh, it was. You know, there, and she was still having to spend some time away. You were also, were you also going to the massage parlors and strip joints during the period of time? In 2016 and 17, and I can't tell you by no means exact dates, but I would think in 2016 and 17, I probably went to, as a total, certainly not every month or week, maybe a total in 2016 and 17 of maybe at least 15 to different times, 15 to 20 different times. I believe you said this was causing you some problems emotionally. Yeah. Well, it, it was certainly uh, by trying to keep that inside, I, I really believe now if I would have went to Austin and told him I feel sure what he would have done was pick up the phone and call Diane and say, well, let's get her in here. And I was scared. I, I did not want to hurt Diane. It was not about Diane. It was not about her wrongdoing at all. It was about a selfish need that I messed around with too closely. And obviously, you, because of your involvement in the church and your police police, that was a problem for you. It was an, a serious problem for me. And as Austin said, I had, he began to see the signs. And of course, his, his plate was so full, he even told me he, when he came to Central Prison to see me, he said, I owe you an apology. I said, you don't owe me an apology. And he said, I felt like I could have done more when I saw the signs. I said, no, you couldn't have done more. You, you, he, he spoke of it often. I was a grown man. Nobody forced me to do that but it was really beginning to bother me so much that I personally have a belief that that's what led to 
the depression. Speaking of the depression, when did you, when did you notice that you weren't feeling right for lack of a better term? Well, early on in 2017, around Christmas, uh, and in 2016, beginning 2017, when business would get slow, then I guess I had more time to think about things in life. So that's when I would kind of get down, and then all of a sudden, the phone would start ringing. I would be called in all kind of directions. So I guess that, in my opinion, helped mask that pain because I was back busy again. See, I'm sitting there with nothing to do, and I'm thinking about it all the time, that I need to stop this foolishness. And then when it gets busy, I forget about it. The end of 2017, when it got slow, did it bounce back for you in a way to mask the problem? I stopped completely with, uh, I would say, around August of 2017, at that same time, uh, I was at the beach house, either we were fixing up, closing up for the summer, whatever. This lady approached me again. She realized we were there. We owed her some money, so she came by. We gave her the money for cleanup, and she said, "Let's go out. Let's go, you know, down here to this restaurant and and have a drink or whatever." And uh, we it was just started out as talk, just just talking, and so I went with her. Or she went, I think we even drove separate vehicles, and we got something to eat. And then she followed me back to the beach house, and she made it real clear that she followed me back for sex. And so we kind of, she walked in, and we kind of started. She wanted to kiss me, and I kind of kissed her and all, and immediately when I did, a feeling come over me of such massive guilt. I, I remember patting her on the shoulder, and I said, you, you've got to go. She said, well, what am I, have I done, done something wrong? And I think I said, I love my wife, I love my family, go. And she left. So maybe we went out to eat a couple times. In that episode, I never saw her again after, I guess, August of 2017. She texted a couple times, but I wouldn't respond or either, you know, just put her off in some way. Did she tell that one about that? Yes. When did you tell that one about that? That would have been in 2018. Early, late. Early. Uh, I, I felt like that I knew what caused this depression, so I went and told her, honey, I've made a, a, some mistakes. This woman approached me. There was no sex. No sex. She left. I haven't seen her since. I've gone to some massage parlors. I wanted to get that out. I've gone to a couple strip joints over the end of 16 and 17, maybe four or five total. And I said, I just wanted to get that out, hoping that that was going to help the reason I was so depressed. It did not. It helped in the sense that I got it out to her, and it helped in the sense that she was so forgiving and loving. You know, most women may have just knocked the man's head off or told him to hit the trail or threw him up, close out the door. She was very loving, 
very understanding, amazing, Christ-like love, unconditional love. Well, you told her about all this, and that didn't seem to help you with the way you were doing Oh, I was, I was begging doctors to help me. I told her, I said, uh, I woke up one morning, it was getting worse. I woke up one morning and she was trying her best. She was trying everything she could try by, based on advice. She'd say, get up, go to work, get up, everything's going to be great. I said, honey, I can't get up. I'm shaking, I'm trembling. I said, we've got to get to the doctor. Now, keep in mind, I had already gone to two. two doctors? Yeah. She didn't know. She, yeah, she knew about it. But my family doctor, then I went to a wellness doctor, which was an MD. They're the ones that told me I needed all these supplements, and I went and bought a grocery bag full of supplements. And then I'm taking the medication from my primary doctor. And so me and her go up, and we talk to him, and we pull in. It was so bad, the shaking was so bad, and I'm surprised Diane trusted me so much to let me drive, and we drove to the Lincoln County emergency room. And I pulled in the, up in front of the emergency room. Oh, God. I called Amanda. I said, Amanda, I need help. Amanda said, Roger, it sounds like you're having a nervous breakdown. I said, what can I do? She said, you need to go in there. You need to commit yourself. You need to get some serious help. I was terrified. I was terrified. Why? I, I would lose my business. And I was terrified. And so I went to the doctor, my regular doctor. We didn't even have an appointment. I walked in and we went to see the doctor. And when Diane showed him that grocery bag full of supplements, he went crazy. Well, not really crazy. He just got mad. He said, Roger, what are you doing? You got all these supplements. You're taking all these supplements. They're not even FDA approved. And you're taking what I've got. And I said, yeah, and I've been to this other doctor and, and a therapist. And he said, this is out of my league. I mean, he told me, he said, you need a psychiatric help. And so he said, go down to my bookkeeper's office and make some calls. I'm going to schedule you some blood work. And so I go to her office, and me and her sit there and try to call psychiatrists. And nobody would see me. And so they was either months out or wouldn't even return my phone call. Do you remember when this was? That was in 2018, January, February, somewhere, March maybe. And so I called Tracy Philbeck and I said, Tracy, because he knows a lot about, you know, the, the, the hospital and that kind of stuff. I said, is there any way you can call one of the board members or something, see if they can get me an appointment? He said, I'll call you right back. He called one of the board members, and he said, this board member is going to be calling and setting you up an appointment. I said, I want it today. He said, I don't know when. So the board member called me, and she said, I got you an appointment for tomorrow at 1 o'clock. And Diane and I go to see a psychiatrist, and he was real nice. And he said when his boss called, he had to see me. So I got in, and I saw him. He did. And and I also told him I was on medication from the other doctor. So he compared it, and then he said, you still need this. I had n no clue what this was. Do you remember what it was he prescribed? It was some antidepressant something, and I was also on an antidepressant. And he said, well, you got to stop this one and start that one. I couldn't sleep at night. I had ambience. I had severe headaches, severe, severe headaches. I went 
Oh gosh, I don't know how many MRIs I had in my brain thinking that maybe something was wrong. There was real loud ringing in my ears and the headaches along with the depression. In 2017 early, I went and had an MRI at Gaston and they said, you know, the only thing we can think of is your sinuses are so deep, however I was made, that it could be causing these headaches, so they give me, you know, some medication there. And when I took it, I remember I had a meeting to attend in Wilmington. And I took it and was on the way to Wilmington and began to tremble. I mean, I began to shake. I thought something was wrong with me. I text Ronnie or call Ronnie the gentleman in the wheelchair, and I said, Ronnie, pray for me, I need help. I said, something's wrong. I never told Ronnie, I was again too ashamed to tell Ronnie the other part. And so, I felt like it made me worse. So when I called the doctor, I said, it's worse. He said, well, this don't work overnight. And I said, yeah, but I'm worse. So, and I'm not being critical, I'm not a doctor, don't know anything about prescribing drugs, but he said, well, I'm going to change it. So we changed it, and then it continued to get worse. And you said this was around March 2018? February, March, April grew progressively worked. I think the last case I worked officially was in... February, I went up to Raleigh Durham area somewhere and worked an investigation. I was so nervous and so scared that I was going to have a wreck or pass out or something happened to me. I pulled over on the side of the road and threw up and I was able to go. It was very hard. I worked the case and I came back so that was in February. So at that point after that? I still got this other bag of stuff at that point. Still got it. When you say that was the last case you worked, why was that the last case you worked? I was scared to death that I was going to, that I was going to go to a job and freak out and start shaking or trembling when I met an owner of a business. I was terrified that that was going to happen to me. And so the man that testified yesterday, Mike Laney, prior to this, he rode with me on two cases. He sat in the car, he stayed in the car, and I said, I want you to ride with me just in case I get to where I can't drive. And he said, I, I'll help you any way I can. He rode down to Bennettsville, South Carolina, and down near Charleston, South Carolina. Two different trips, and that was it. That was the last time I worked, was I guess in fit, actually worked. Tell me a little about your thought processes at this point. I understand you were afraid that you were going to have issues if you met somebody. Oh yeah, I was terrified that I was going to meet, again, I had never had, I've spoke in front of a thousand people. and. Wasn't even nervous. But then this shaking and trembling was so bad, if I just met somebody one on one, I was scared to even talk to them. Scared that I was going to start shaking and trembling or my words wasn't going to come out right and I wouldn't have a business after that. That was my fear. Yes, it got, it can, to describe that kind of pain, I, I don't even have, it's not like a physical, like I've had kidney stones, that's pretty easy to describe, you feel like somebody stuck a knife in your back, but to describe this pain, I, 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 I the pain is so, it was so massive, it was so hurting 
it was it was almost physical I mean I, it's hard, and that's what I tried to tell Detective Dover who I tried my best to say it's hard to explain what I'm feeling inside I'm I'm disconnecting emotionally and then that doctor at the hospital I called him back and I said I need your help really bad and he was on vacation and that scared me even more and that continued to progress and I only wanted to be around just the, the, the close people in my family was which Diane, Taylor and Josh and the grandkids, Kendall and Kayla. I wanted, I could be around them but still was very uncomfortable. I felt like I'm gonna embarrass my whole family by being so sick. I could not talk like I'm talking to you now. That was impossible. It was impossible. At some point before you begin to feel that God had abandoned you? The pain the the pain was so bad. I thought there's gotta be a reason for this. I know what I have done wrong. I believe that led to this, and so I got the Bible, and again, I'm, I'm in no condition, so I, re I was reading different parts of the Bible where God did. I mean, God judged people in some severe ways in the Bible from, he would cause destruction on entire populations and the whole world at one time, you remember, uh, Noah. And so I felt like that I had I felt like this pain is because God has just forgot, forgot about me. <laughs> I felt like he forgot me. And I told Austin that. And Austin said, you're crazy. God has not abandoned you. I said, but I feel like he has. Where is he? <laughs> I his help. And Austin did his best. He did everything he could do. Money, my brother, he did everything he could do. I hit she's there right beside me doing everything. Taylor, Kate, they're there with me. I got such a supporting... Oh, and my mom, I didn't want to tell my mom because... She's 89, she's sitting back there. I was afraid if I told my mom, she would have a heart attack. Her boy, her boys didn't behave that way. And you don't go tell your mom you've been to a strip joint. She would have probably beat me to death. Maybe that's what I should have done. She's a wonderful person, she's sitting back there. She's a wonderful person. Her husband died just recently, but she, she would have helped me any way she could. But I was afraid. This is something you don't brag about. This is something you don't tell people about. Your family was trying to help you. They were, but they didn't know how. This this is this is a. As Austin said, this is a subject that how do you help some? It's almost like if you're diagnosed with a brain tumor and you go to your wife and say, no, I want you to fix it. She may want to help you, but she don't know how. And I think that's that was the bottom line. They didn't know what to do. And at that time, um, were you taking medication that was prescribed for you? Yeah. Taking it from where it was supposed to be taken? Uh, I got, I got, the worst part was at night. My head would be under so much extreme pressure. It, I know one time Diane and I had rode to Boone. And we just rode to Boone. And uh, I had to go to this one of the ski lodges and meet with one of the owners. And then we went and ate. 
And coming back, I felt like my head was going to explode. This was in 2017. So I had, the doctor had given me some pain medication to try to ease that, and then I couldn't sleep, so he gave me some Ambien. So I've got this menu of medication, and I start taking it. I got confused. I'm not a drug user. Never have been. Never. And I'm confused. What you're saying is you didn't take it the way it was prescribed. Oh, listen, I did not, probably, because I would look up on the web, you would type something in Google, I would type in Google one of the medications then, and all of a sudden you can read everything. I mean, some people said this will cause hallucinations, it will cause this, it will even kill you. And then, So I called the pharmacist, I said, should I take this? And I am desperately, desperately seeking help. This was something I was hiding no more. I had told my wife and God about the sexual immorality. I had cleared that up. And I even told my brother about that, I think. And but the pain was still so severe I didn't know what to do. All I wanted was to help. My daddy died when he was 65. 65 years old, we lost our dad. And it was, he didn't even know he had it. He didn't even know he had cancer all over his entire body, his brain, his lungs, his kidneys. And he died 10 weeks after we found out. And, and then his dad died in his 60s. I was so afraid to leave my family. I was afraid I was going to die. The pain was so bad. I'm sorry. I don't mean to yell. Uh, I was so hurt inside. And part of it, I'm sure, was my fault because you're not supposed to listen to three different doctors at the same time, at least not about the same subject. I do know that. But I was trying to do that. I was trying hard because I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I didn't want to leave my family. And I, I don't know what else to say. I tried as hard as I could try. I understand you were trying to doing what you thought you were supposed to be doing. Was it helping? Or oh, was your condition getting worse. I remember the first day that I took one of the antidepressants. I was heading to Wilmington, and I had the antidepressant with me in my hand. I stopped by the drugstore and got it, and I took it in Gastonia. As I'm going down 74, I began to tremble and shake, and I thought I just took that, so I'm relating what I had just done to what was happening to me physically. And I got to Wilmington. And I met with the I was able to meet with the client. And then I was scheduled to go to Myrtle Beach at a convention. And I drove down there. I was shaking so bad I couldn't eat. I went and met my employee at the convention in Myrtle Beach. And sweat was running down my head. He said, what's wrong? I said, I don't feel good. I'm going back to Gastonia. And so I drove back. And so I was afraid to take another pill the next day. So then I take this, this pill to try to fix it. And then that's when I called Brian. And I said, Brian, you've been depressed. He said, you got to stay on it. I said, I done messed that part up. That's where I was. I messed it up trying to help myself. Let's look around the events from the, around the time that the event occurred. Okay. Do you remember uh, May 19th? Yes, sir. Do you remember going to Shooters Express? Yes, sir. Actually, on, I'm, I was 62 years old at that time. Never in my entire life, ever, remotely, 
thought about harming myself or anyone else, myself or anyone, never remotely. And on the Friday before, it was like, I'm hurting so bad. I'm hurting so bad. I've got to end this. And then I'm thinking, this is stupid. This is crazy. What, what am I thinking? I couldn't shake the thought. And so that Saturday morning, I think Josh had texted me and told me the kids had a, he was trying, Josh was trying hard to keep me active, thinking that was the answer. And I'm sure he was just doing all he knew to do. And Amanda was trying to help him help me. And bless her heart, she was doing everything she could do. And so, uh, I actually head toward the ball field where Kendall and Caleb were praying. I actually playing. I actually got in my Jeep and was headed there. I thought, well, maybe this will work. I don't know how to explain this. This is what I tried to tell you, Detective Tober. I couldn't explain it. I'm headed to wherever they're playing in Stanley or over there somewhere. The next thing I actually remember, I'm sitting in the parking lot of Shooter's Express. I was aware. I was extremely aware of where I was, but it was like a dream. You know, if you're having, I don't know how, if you have dreams or not, but you can't really control them. You know, you can't go to the right or the left if you're going this way in the dream. And that's where I felt, I felt that's the only way I could describe it. I'm sitting in Shooter's Express parking lot, a grown man that knows and understands the law. I had that permit. And I thought that's the easiest thing to do. And then I and, and then I would think. What do you mean that's the easiest thing? To do? Just in my own life, like Mr. Harper said yesterday, he that thought entered that thought had never once, ever. I had a cousin that killed himself, and I remember talking to his mom, and thinking, what would cause and even my mom and my wife? I said, what would cause an individual? to put that thought in their head. I thought, there is no way I would harm myself. The next thing I realized, I'm standing there at that booth looking at, I don't even know what I was looking. All I knew is I was looking at different weapons. And I just went up and down through there looking. I was shaking a little bit. And I, I don't fault the guy. There, the place was rather busy, I remember very clearly. I don't fault him. And I just looked at that one and I said, I, I'll take that one. I had my permit so I knew I didn't have to go through a waiting process, but Josh had all of my guns. And I thought that's the easiest thing to do. That was Saturday around lunchtime somewhere. Jason had called me from New Orleans right after lunch. I either called him back or he had texted me or something. And I just tell the guy, I said, this is the one I want. And I know we should, saw the laser and all that, so I didn't even realize the thing, I didn't even know, I actually thought the gun was brown, it looked black from, from out there, but I just said, I'll take that one, I'll take that box of ammunition. I done it, checked out, went out in the parking lot, I'm going home, and I'm thinking, I can't believe what I just did. I'm sitting there looking at it, sitting on the seat. I'm thinking, I cannot believe what I just did. And then that night, Diane, we slept in separate beds, not because we didn't love each other. It's because what we snore like crazy, both of us. I don't know if anybody else has that problem or not, but we did. And so she'd sleep one in the hall and I'd sleep on the other end of the hall. And so that night, she went to bed on her end of the hall and I had stopped by Robinson's Lake to visit them. I didn't fish. I couldn't have fished if I wanted to. I was just shaking and trembling. I, Tracy wasn't really talking to me. He was fishing. Charlie actually talked to me. He said, Roger, can I help you in any way? And I said, Charlie, I wished you could. He said, I'm here for you. I said, I know you are. And I go home and Diane had a hamburger there for me. I took one bite of it. I took one bite, threw it in the trash can. And then, like she said, we went out on the porch, we sat and talked. And about 11.30 that night, I guess, I just get up and walk out to my Jeep 
and I picked it up. The gun. And I walked up through my front yard. We got a lot of pine trees. I walked up through my front porch uh, and then out onto the pines and I laid down and I stuck it to my chest. I thought this this will end this pain. But then the only thing I could think of was my children and my wife. I thought they can't see me this way. That cannot happen. That cannot happen. It was like a dream. And so I went back took it out of the box, stuck the box under the front seat, went in, stuck it under the mattress. By that time, it's getting early. Sun's early in the morning, yeah. There was a camera, and Taylor actually told me after this that she went to that outside camera's DVR and looked, and she said, I saw you walking around out there, Daddy, and you were cleaning windows. I said, cleaning windows? And then she told me later, she said, no, you, you just had this rag with you. And I guess I had a rag or something, but uh, I, as soon as I laid down to go to sleep, and then it's time to get up, I go to church. And this is the morning of May 20th, correct? I go to church. I hadn't been going much even, and that had never happened to me, ever. Not that I feel like you have to be in church every Sunday. By no means you don't. But I was always there, and uh, I remember going in, and it was like I'm in a dream, this same dream. I sat down beside Kate. She's sitting here. I think Taylor or Diane's to my right. Alex is to my left. I remember the part that I can remember clearly. Kate, Miss Pat Barr, she said, it's going to be all right, Dad. I said, I hope so, Kate. Something's wrong. And I remember seeing Austin's wife. She's standing in the back with the singing group. And it's like her eyes are lasered in on me. It's like she's looking right at me, making eye contact. And she looked so concerned. Her look was so, it was almost like the look Carrie had on her, Austin's wife. I can remember seeing her looking at me as if she's afraid or in fear. I don't remember what he said during the sermon. I don't remember. He mentioned, I do remember him mentioning part of what he had told me. And maybe he was doing it because I was sitting there. That God's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. And when I walked out, one guy walked up and grabbed me by the arm. He said, Roger, I didn't know. What I think he meant was, I didn't know you were having this problem. He grabbed me by the arm. And I ain't even sure I spoke to him. I just kept on walking. And then that's when I walked up to Raj, Big Raj, and all of them were standing there talking. And it's like, it, it was like I was still in this dream. I'm going outside. I, I can't talk to these people around me now. I'm scared. And my fear was they're going to see me panicking, I think. That's the best I can recall. Do you remember going to church? I do. I remember on the way going there, Diane got kind of irritated with me because I was driving real slow. And I think that was for two reasons. I could feel this shaking coming, and I was afraid to drive any faster. And she kept saying, why are you driving so slow? And I said, honey, something's wrong with me. Something's wrong. And she said, I know, but 
we got to go there. Alex and Kate are, and their families are going to be there, and it's important that you be there. And I said, I want to be there, but something is wrong with me. And she kept on telling me. She's encouraging me, trying to encourage me. And uh, so... Do you remember what happened when you got there? Yeah, when we got there, this headache comes on. And I said, have you got any Tylenol? She said, yes, and I think I took two Tylenol. My head is under under this pressure again. My head's under this pressure. And that's, that was not a dream. I could feel the pain. And when we walked in, the, the owner, Melissa, she saw me. And she said, hey. And she spoke to me. And I, I said, hey, Melissa. I, I may have not even spoke to her, but I know she spoke to me. And and she said, I'd lost all this weight, and I guess she did, she couldn't see the real me. She maybe saw that I'd trim. She said, you look looking good or something like that. And I remember just turning around walking back to the table, and when we sat down, my fear, I was in such fear. You were what? that I was going to embarrass my family, that I was going to start this shaking. And I was, I was looking at Josh and his son, Caleb, he was over there acting up. And I remember trying my best to focus on him and get this fear process out. And Diane ordered, and when the food came, I remember sticking my fork into the salad and my hand began to shake. And my thought was, I'm getting ready to embarrass my whole family. I'm getting ready to embarrass everyone. And I said, I got to go. And Diane said, you got to go. I said, I got to go to the, the car and get a Tylenol. She said, you just got one. I said, yeah, but my head's hurting. I was so afraid that I was going to embarrass every family member I had, and I did not want to do that to Kate and Alex particularly. It was their planning time. I didn't want to embarrass any of them. And so I got in the Jeep, and I thought, I'm going to go home. And then it was almost like this dream starts again. And I remember driving around and then stop. I, I think I stopped. Now, I wouldn't watch the video yesterday, but I think I stopped. And it's just like this. It's, the Jeep takes off. And when I, get, when, I, when I go inside that place, um, it was like all emotions, emotions that a person should be having. It was like nothing would connect. It was like it wasn't syncing up. It was like maybe something out of tune, and there's, it's not syncing up. The emotions are not there. You said you go into the place. Is that when you drove? When I drove into there, and all I remember seeing, I was just sitting there, staring ahead. I remember it so clearly. I was sitting there, staring ahead. And the first thing I see is Taylor comes to the door, and I remember her saying, you're the best man, you're the best man, Daddy, I love you so much, I love you so much, and it was like, I heard her, I could hear her, mm -hmm. but it wasn't sinking. It was not like there was no emotions to that, even though I wanted emotions to be with that. And then I knew people were hurt, I knew people had to be hurt. But it's like I could not seem to get my thought process synced up with what actually happened. That's the only way I know how to describe it. I, it's like it wouldn't sync up. The emotions, of the numbness was, I knew what happened. I didn't intentionally, I did not intentionally do that. But there were no emotions. If if I would have realized, first of all, that would have never happened if my mind had been in sync with my body. It would have never happened. 
I would have been hysterical. You watched them play the video. You were present for the interview with the police. You were able to talk to them. When I was listening to that interview, I listened to that interview. I never watched the video, and I don't want to see the video. When I was listening to that interview with Detective, I think, is it Dover? I think it's Dover. When I was listening to that sitting there, I was so heartbroken. I was heartbroken, not just from what had happened, but that I couldn't believe how I was talking to him. I was carrying on a what appeared to be a lucid conversation but it was like there's no emotions which I knew that but listening to it again made it even worse for me I I was so hurt by that why was there no emotions was it the medication the lack of the starting and starting and mixing and was it something else I wished, I wished I knew. I wished I had the answer. But I can promise you, sir, I have never, ever hurt anyone physically. I'm sure I've hurt people with maybe what I've said or I, what I didn't say. or I'm sure I've hurt my wife and children many, many times by my attitude or what I've said or what I didn't say or said it in the wrong way. I can only remember hitting one person in my entire life. I was a city police officer, and a man reached for uh, he reached for me. He was a lot bigger than me. That was in the old, old days in the 70s. The jail was at the county courthouse, and he reached out to grab me, and I hit him in the arm with my flashlight. I'd never been in a fight in school. I got, I got hit a couple times just bullies but I've never physically hurt anyone would not ever ever hurt anyone and I couldn't understand why the emotion was not there I, I could not comprehend that it was so unbelievable it's like watching the planes fly into the World Trade Center you know they're flying into it you know that's real but it's like so unbelievable and I also to myself I tried to I was watching TV one night up there in Central Prison. It showed this tsunami, how the people, when the water rushed out, stood there and stared at it. Instead of running, they're staring at the water because what they're seeing is so unreal, unbelievable. And now the emotions did come back eventually. Eventually they came back in a huge way. A, a huge way, a couple months. I, when you say that, what do you mean? Uh, the, you remember I told you about the numbness, the lack of emotions? When I first got to Central Prison, I was so numb, and then this doctor comes in and he gives me a handful of different pills. I mean, it's a handful. He says, you take these. So I took those. And I wake up, they're handing me breakfast. I wake up again. I'm sleeping all night. I'm sleeping all day. I'm sleeping around the clock, and I thought, what's causing that? And then a psychologist comes around, and I told him, I said, I'm sleeping all the time. I told him what I was taking. He said, well, this one will help you relax. This one will help you sleep. This is antidepressant. This is that. I said, I want to be of a clear mind. And then when I finally, after about, I'm locked down and uh, under suicide watch, I can't see or talk to anybody except him. He would come around one hour a day. And uh, when I started actually paying attention to my surroundings, I was more scared than I've ever been scared in my life. I'm in prison. I'm in, a, I'm in this room and I could hear these guys yelling and screaming at one another. The guy beside me, I mean, he can't get to me, but he's talking about that he cut somebody's head off up in Wilkes County. 
and he said I cut that man's head off he's just screaming out and other people are screaming out and the psychologist said no we're going to put you through phases on uh, you're going to go through like three phases and then we're going to move you up and I thought what does that mean I didn't even know what that meant and it meant me they gave me clothes instead of the the padded uniform And they gave you medication while you were in central prison? Uh, I'm still taking it. It's like I'm sleeping constantly. I couldn't get awake. And then finally, I remember these officers from the prison came, and this lady and some men, and they said, do you want to be protected? Yes, I, I definitely want to be protected. I didn't know what that meant. Well, let's, let's talk about the psychiatric treatment you received, okay? That I was getting up there? That you were getting up there. You said they were giving you medication. Did that um, medication help with your thought processes and things of that nature eventually? I slept all the time. Eventually. I mean, not completely 24 hours, but a lot. And then when I wake up, I would be scared. I was scared to death. I'd never been in an environment like that. It was horrible. Did your thought processes get better though? Eventually? Eventually, my height of my day would be talking to this psychologist when he come around because they wouldn't let you talk to nobody, to anyone. And then you came up. I think you were the first. I think Monty was the second. Then I think Dr. Corbin come. Then I think Taylor come. And that was the height of my day is to get to talk to somebody when I saw you even, but I still was not, I wasn't 100% by no means. But when you were in there, you were in they worked with you and your psychological condition there? Eventually what happened was I, I did continue to sink back up but then I'm on this protective custody and they tell me I can't eat. I said, I, I want to call home. They said, well, you can't call, like for two months. I said, I just want to talk to somebody because I really wasn't sure what really had happened, who all had been hurt. I knew what I had been told by Monty on Sunday night, but I wanted, I was so worried about Kendall and Caleb and Kennedy, I was so worried about them and everybody else, Diane and Josh, but I was, I was so afraid that I had hurt even more people and I told that psychologist that and I told the psychiatrist that. And uh, after about two months, they kind of, they called it moving me up to a different floor and they said, you can have property up here, you can go to the canteen, but they, let, they kept me locked up. And I said, why are y'all keeping me locked up? They said, well, you said you wanted to be protected. I said, I don't want to be protected. I, if it means I can't even get out to take a shower when I want to, it was taking like one a week, and they said, I want to order some food, and they said, you can't order that food. I said, why? They said, because you're on protective custody. I didn't understand any of that. Eventually, I told, I think that was when I finally got out. I did write the warden and I said, I need to get this protective cut. It didn't make sense. You couldn't even have a snicker bar if you was on protective custody. And I was starving. Couldn't eat that food. And so I wrote the warden and said, I need to be off protective custody. And I wrote the sergeant and the captains and they finally said, well, we're going to take you off protective custody. So they finally did, and then I had another visit with a psychiatrist once they released me from there, and I told him, I said, I'm sleeping all the time. I don't want to do that. I cannot sleep all the time. He says, okay, I'm going to take you off of this, continue to take this, and it improved some. As far as I was awake longer, I began to be more aware of what had happened. But now there's another problem. I am scared 
to death. And I can't say, I can't say, we, we got cameras back there and media here. I can't say everything I was afraid of. In prison, it's just rough. And when they finally let me out to a cell, these gang members approached me and asked me what I did for a living and what I have done for a living. And I was terrified. I was terrified they were going to kill me. I saw them try to kill one another. Were you continuing to receive psychological help? The psychiatrist was not as frequent. Psychologists would come. And there was kind of this rule, you don't tell anything. I didn't know, I've never been locked up. And when I, I didn't know whether to tell them about the gang members approaching me or not. Did they continue to treat you psychologically? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And over the period of time that you've been there in Central Prison, tell me about how your mindset and your mentality thought. Do you still have the issues you had in January it, it, and it, it began to come back, and then it as it comes back, as my mind begins to clear up by August now, it's when they've got me in the open sales, like at 16. Okay, August of 2018? Mm-hmm. Okay. By the time I get in there, I'm more aware of my surroundings. I'm more aware mentally of my surroundings. But then it was so hard to think about it because I'm scared to death. I'm terrified of these gang members. Did, uh, did you manage to reach a resolution with that from the psychiatrist? I told the psychiatrist. See, they would meet, the psychiatrist would actually meet with me less frequently as time went on, the psychologist less frequently. Well, when I finally went back to the psychiatrist again, uh, they had a change. I went like to three different ones. So one, I don't know what kind of notes they kept, but I'm talking to this guy, then I'm talking to this woman, then I'm talking to this guy. And finally, I told one of them, I said, uh, I'm still sleepy a lot. He said, well, let's take you off of these. So then they began to work it down gradually. And I don't remember the number. All I know is they would come in the morning and noon and, and, and then late in the evening. Did they manage to get your psychological situation stabilized? I began to slowly, I felt like, come back to my senses. Slowly. And how long it was before you felt like you were, shall we say, back to your senses? Oh, they began to come back clearly by August. And then September got even better. But then I was so scared. I was physically scared now. I know what I was afraid of now. You see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Without being too specific? Because uh -huh. they watch the news up there. And I walked in one day after I'd been here for an appearance. And one of them looked at me. He said, saw you on the news. So I have to be very careful. You were aware of your surroundings. Oh, yes. And your mental capabilities had returned to the point where you could appreciate your surroundings. Well, I couldn't appreciate them. Uh, you understood them. Yeah, I understood them. Yes, sir. You understood the limitations of them. Right. Did you continue to receive psychological treatment over the last... Almost three years now? Yeah. It, it, again, dates here are very, very unclear because you're in there. You, you're, there's no way of keeping track of time. Uh, different psychologists now, different psychiatrists. And as my thoughts really begin to come back clear, then finally, the emotions begin to come back. 
the emotions begin to come. And as far as when that was, I know the first time I talked to Diane on the phone, as soon as I heard her voice, I began to cry. The problem is the phone's right in the middle of the room and you got all these inmates staring at you, And but I didn't care. The tears came and I was so grateful that the tears came because the emotions were coming back. But I'm at the same time, I'm scared for my life. And I may shouldn't say that with the media. I hope they won't say that. Let's go back a little. In February, March, and April of 2018, you were on various types of medication as well. Mm-hmm. I may have a question. Yes, sir. Remarked for identification as exhibit number two. I believe this has previously been stipulated to by both parties. Yes. But that's correct. That is in the stipulation, Your Honor. The medication that was. All right, so that would be admitted. Do you recognize those items? You want to take them out or are you just saying? I can't see them. medications we were talking about? Those came out of my home? Yes, sir. Tramadol? I know that, what that is. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember this one at all. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I just didn't realize it was in that big. That's blood pressure. Um, Roger so. Yep. You said blood pressure. Is one, that one of them? Lisinopril. That's unbelievable. I didn't realize there were that many. Do you, you know what they are? The central thing? You know what that is? No. Montelli cast? No, sir, I have no idea. You're Roger Self, right? That's right. All these are medications with your prescribed for you at your house at these are all the medications that you've been prescribed by the various doctors? These caps look strange. Has the caps changed to something? The, this this red part, I don't remember seeing that. But it's but I guess it is. I, I remember that's definitely blood pressure. And actually there's there there even should be more. There was some ambience and some oh. 
Klonopin? Uh huh. I remember that. I remember that. Hemulosin, tramadol. I remember the tramadol, and I remember that. Trazodone. Yeah. I, re I remember some of these, some of these I do not remember at all. But these were all prescribed for you during that period of time? I guess so, if they were in my medicine cabinet. I had no idea, I mean, I just, that, that's mind boggling. If I had to try to figure out what to take from that right now, I have no idea, except the blood pressure. And for the record, Your Honor, uh, the medication are in the exhibit that's marked State uh, Defense Exhibit Number Two. Okay. Mr. Dean, we have number two. Number two. 